Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, before we get started, I just want to thank Christine Slazowski from Alternative Communication Services for providing CART this evening. Thank you so much, Christine. Dr. Sami, it's, it's a pleasure to have you tonight. Uh, your work is fascinating. Uh, everybody should see your credentials on the screen, so I'm not going to repeat those, but I will just um, let people know um, that at the end of Dr. Sami's presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. If you think of questions as he's going along, you can go ahead and just put those in the Q&A. And at the end, I'll just voice those questions to you, Dr. Sami, so that they become part of the CART transcript. Wonderful. And I look forward to your presentation. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Macklin. It is a pleasure and an honor to do this. And uh, I will spend, as Ms. Macklin and I are talking about, about 30 minutes in doing this presentation. And uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions at the end. Uh, I put my email here and I have that at the end as well because there are times when it's some of these presentations, even though I feel like I've done this for so long and it's uh, something I'm so used to, clearly it is a complicated topic. And so feel free to reach out to me at uh, by my email address. So Ms. Macklin and I talked about uh, Jessica Toes and uh, there was no concern about HIPAA violation. And Jessica Toes is one of those people that when you meet her, and she becomes a part of your life. You just never forget her. And she brings a smile to your face. And so uh, this is her picture down here. And I'm going to give a little bit of her background. And Jessica is one of the most giving, kind people I've ever met in my life. And in fact, she is a big part of our cochlear implant group and our acoustic neuroma association group because she suffers from neurofibromatosis type 2 or NF2. And when I first met her, she initially came into my office and she said the funniest thing, she wanted to look at my socks. And I've never in my two decades of doing what I do, had someone say they wanted to look at my socks. And she said it was a sign from God for her that if I had funny socks, that I would be the right surgeon for her. And so sure enough, I have twin daughters who are 10 years old. And so they try to get dad to look more stylish. And so she saw my funny socks and I started wearing funny socks from a couple of uh, Christmases ago. And so when she first came in, she said, I want an auditory brainstem implant. I want an ABI. And it's always smart to take a step back and say, is that the right thing to do? Are there other options? And so actually it turned out we decided not to do an ABI as the first step. She has with NF2, and I'll explain that more in my slides coming up. We decided she has a smaller tumor on the right side. We radiated that tumor, and that's also known as radio surgery or stereotactic radiation therapy, with the hope that that would prevent that right-sided tumor from growing significantly. And so she, on her right side, has a cochlear implant. Well, see, she did so well with that. She's an amazing lip reader, but she did so well with that. She and her husband have two adopted children. And it brings tears to your eyes when you hear her say that that's really the first time that she's heard her kids. And so after we did the right cochlear implant, uh, we ended up going on the left side. She already had a trans labyrinthine resection before for um, acoustic neuroma resection. And so we went from a retrosigmoid approach, and I'll discuss those approaches in a moment. Um, and so put an ABI on her. So she's one of the few patients in the world that actually has a cochlear implant on one side and auditory brainstem implant on the other side. And so she's a remarkable story. And I think that whenever you talk about a topic, whether it's auditory brainstem implantation, cochlear implants, hearing aids, there's always a person and a story behind it. And I think that's what's very important to think about is the ability to change people's lives is really a blessing for me to be a part of this. So I'm gonna move this. Um, uh, video here, but this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, speech is civilization itself. The word, even the most contradictory word, preserves contact. It is silence which isolates. And there's a great uh, story that, um, that uh, comes up from years ago when someone asked Helen Keller, 
who was born with a little bit of hearing, a little bit of eyesight, and then she lost both subsequently. And I believe it's Ann Sullivan who helped her learn how to communicate. And so they asked her, would she rather have her sight back or her hearing back? And she said she'd rather have her hearing back. And I think that surprised a lot of people when they heard that. She says that when you lose your vision, it separates you from things. When you lose your hearing, it separates you from people. And so I think that's very interesting to think about, uh, especially as I deal with my own parents who are in their 80s who are losing hearing and how um, they, before they received hearing aids, were really becoming more socially isolated. So what disease does this patient have? This is a perfect example of NF2 or neurofibromatosis type 2. And so these are also known as vestibular schwannomas. There's one on the right side, one on the left side. This is an MRI scan after contrast has been given. And this patient uh, has very large tumors. Um, the nose would be up at the top. You can see the sinuses, right ear, left ear. And so when we see tumors like this, on the one hand, I think about, okay, how's the patient's quality of life? How's their hearing? How's their facial nerve function? But you also have to prioritize, which is making sure that this tumor, especially on the left-hand side, does not become life-threatening. The problem for patients such as this with larger tumors is as much as you'd like to maybe radiate a tumor just like I did with Ms. Toes um, and then put a cochlear implant is, you typically have with these larger tumors, have to remove them, remove them completely. And then when you do that, you can't rely on the cochlear nerve anymore for a cochlear implant. So that's where an auditory brainstem implant um, comes about in terms of how we improve uh, patients' quality of life and improve the hearing. So if you look back at the history of the auditory brainstem implant, first implanted by the legendary team of Bill House and Bill Hitzelberger in 1979, it's amazing to think that uh, almost 40 years ago, they were doing some work that even to this day, uh, is not necessarily easy surgery to do. And this is before a lot of the modern anesthetic techniques, intraoperative monitoring to monitor the facial nerve and other aspects of the brain function. And so that person was using it for many decades after he was implanted. Now, there are about, uh, probably by now, maybe 900 or 1,000 implanted worldwide. And while that sounds like a decent number, that's only since 1979. So to put it in perspective, there are approximately over 300 to 400,000 cochlear implants in the world. So 1,000 for auditory brainstem implants or ABIs versus roughly three to 400,000 for, uh, for cochlear implants tells you it's a huge difference in numbers and patients that are good candidates for this. So the FDA approved its use in 2000 after going through clinical trials in the 1990s. And for a long time, uh, people were just using it only for adults in the U.S. And I think one of the things that's really been amazing to me about ABIs is that while people think that they are not as good as cochlear implants, it's comparing apples to oranges. For patients such as NF2, which is the primary indication, um, they can give an improvement in quality of life that really is not otherwise uh, easily doable for these patients. However, in the early 2000s in Europe, there was a well-known uh, neurotologist named Vittorio Coletti, and Dr. Coletti from Verona, Italy, started using this device in um, um, kids and pediatric patients who were born with that cochlear nerve. So these kids were born deaf. They had no cochlear nerves, so they couldn't receive cochlear implants. Hearing aids wouldn't work. And so he was starting to see some results that we never saw in the adults and so I think what that's done is help revitalize this area. Uh, I'm doing research in my lab and with my colleagues. And so my hope is that we continue to look at different things and ways we can uh, use the auditory brainstem implant to improve people's quality of life. So the main issue is NF2, when someone has bilateral acoustic neuromas typically, that's the hallmark of the disease. However, the condition that Dr. Coletti first talked about in Italy was um, using it for cochlear nerve replacement, meaning children born without any cochlear nerves on, in both ears. Other indications that are rare but can't happen, there are some people that have meningitis, and when they get meningitis, 
um, they'll have a reaction where they'll form uh, bone inside their cochleus. And because of that, once they become deaf for the meningitis, some of them can't receive cochlear implants, thus they're candidates from auditory brainstem implant. Temper bone fractures, that's when some, someone will have a really bad injury, such as from a car accident or an assault, um, and uh, maybe it is a, such a severe injury that the cochlear nerves on both sides are cut. So for those patients, that's an option. And then I have one of my patients who actually, she's interesting because she's a combination of the labyrinthitis occipicans, the bone filling the cochlea, as well as a poor cochlear implant result. So she's a young lady who um, developed labyrinthitis occipicans, and I put cochlear implants on her, and the left side functioned a little bit, the right side didn't function at all, and she was a teenager when I first met her. And so initially for a few years, didn't really want anything done, but as time went on, she asked to have the right side have an ABI because she wasn't getting any benefit. And since she is so young and hopefully has many years ahead of her in terms of quality of life, we removed the right cochlear implant, put an ABI in. So uh, she's done better since that time. So cases are very helpful. So here's another MRI scan. So this patient had already had a right-sided uh, tumor removal. These are post-surgical changes. Really no sign of tumor on the right side, no hearing left on the right side. And then she was referred to me because she actually already had a cochlear implant tried on the right side after her acoustic neuroma, also known as a vestibular schwannoma, after this tumor was removed. And uh, the, unfortunately, the cochlear implant never worked on the right side. So the left side, you can see the tumor here. And the tumor is actually going, it's a little bit subtle, it's actually going into the cochlea right there. And so when we removed this tumor, and took out her entire tumor, uh, we're able to put an auditory brainstem implant in it at the same time. So this is a side view. You can see this is her skull. And so she has her cochlear implant on one side of the skull, that's the side where it's not working, and then the auditory brainstem implant on the left side. And this is a different view. This is a CAT scan. It's as if she's lying down on the table now uh, and receiving a CAT scan, for example. You can see the right side, the post-surgical changes from her prior tumor removal. And then the left side, this is after we operated on her. And then uh, this is just a little bit of signal change from abdominal fat packing into that area. And that electrode's going into the brainstem there. So that's really kind of a neat view to see where it actually sits, actually sits in the brain, as opposed to if it was a cochlear implant, it would sit right here. So this image is just showing um, a side view of the auditory brainstem implant. So the auditory brainstem implants made by two different companies in the world. Uh, one is Cochlear Corporation, which is based out of Sydney, Australia. And the other is the Medel Corporation, which is based out of Austria, but there's only one in the US. So the Medel ABI is not available in the US. They're both very similar in terms of how they look. So if you look at this from a side view, this is very similar to how a cochlear implant looks like. So this is the part that's implanted underneath the skin into the bone. And so this electrode is what we call the active electrode. This is just a ground electrode. And with this active electrode, this is the part that sits into the brainstem. So if I go back for a moment, you can see that right there. That's the active electrode. There it is right there again. This is a close-up view of that. So as opposed to having something that sits in the cochlea very well, these are platinum electrodes. And these platinum electrodes are what sit against the cochlear nucleus in the brainstem. And so this is Medell's version, which is very similar in appearance because you can't have something going into the cochlea, uh, like a long electrode. So these are kind of a flat electrode panel. I like this schematic because I think one of the things it does is just breaks it down and makes it more simple. If you look at how the brain functions and how all the different parts of the brain are a part of hearing uh, from the brainstem to the auditory cortices higher up, so if you take a step back and say, okay, this is the, the housing, the unit for whether it's a cochlear implant or an auditory brainstem implant, the electrode comes out. And if it was a cochlear implant, if someone still had a cochlear nerve, then we'd put the electrode in and that would go into the cochlea. Okay. 
and this is very common, very standard used for a variety of reasons from age-related hearing loss to noise-related hearing loss to genetic hearing loss in children's viral toxicity or viral problems. The paddle of an auditory brainstem implant, instead of going into the cochlea, goes actually into the brainstem. So it's very simple in terms of the schematics, but the difference would be, is the lesion, is there a problem actually in the nerve or in the cochlea, in which case then an auditory brainstem implant would make more sense. So this is an intraoperative view. I hope it's not too graphic for everyone, but I wanted to show you this is on the left side, the left, the ears pulled forward. This is the facial nerve found in the temporal bone, and this is the same electrode going into the brain stem right there. So that's what it looks from an intraoperative standpoint. Now, one of the things here I wanted to show is that there is no such thing as a minor surgery. And so the patient, one of our patients we'd operate on, very nice lady, uh, but very thin, very frail. And unfortunately on top of that, a heavy smoker. And so post-operatively, even though her surgery went well, uh, her skin broke down, you can actually see some of her implant there. And so the problem here is that when you have a wound that doesn't heal well, so uh, we'll end up using tissue from other parts of the body. So this patient ended up ha having what's called a free flap and the tissue was placed on top of that implant itself. And so the reason I wanna show this is, all the surgeries we do always have potential risks and can be very serious. And I often feel like one of the most important things for patients to understand is it really is a team approach that I can do the best job or whoever the surgeon is uh, that sees a patient can do the best job. But until the patient, until, until he or she also is a big fan of all this and does what's right, in terms of taking care of health um, and uh, avoiding smoking, eating right, uh, good protein, things like that, the patients uh, won't heal well postoperatively. So I want to show this as how it is truly a team approach. And when we first activate patients, so these are the paddles that I showed you um, and what they look like and the different electrodes are 22 platinum electrodes for the cochlear device. And so when we first activate this device, since it goes into the brainstem, we're trying to activate the nucleus, the cochlear nucleus that goes to the brainstem and the higher auditory pathway. But there are other cranial nerves that are nearby, and there's parts of the brainstem that we want to make sure that when we first start stimulating, that we don't cause any changes in heart rate or breathing. So initially, uh, when someone first starts an ABI program at their institution, they will have... Uh, the activation done in the PACU, and the PACU is the recovery room. And so we actually, once we do the surgery, patient goes to the ICU, stays in the ICU overnight one night, hospital stay varies from three to five days. And typically we give the patient about a solid month or so for uh, healing processes. And once the healing's done about a month, then we activate in the, in the PACU, in the recovery room. So ABR results, let's um, look at how they are compared to cochlear implants. So the way I'd look at ABI is if it's someone is profoundly deaf, um, their options, of course, include sign language, and some patients choose that and works out very well. Um, but it really is a sound awareness issue as opposed to what's called open set word recognition. So my rule of thumb is most of my adult patients that I do cochlear implants in, I'll tell them the data shows that with a cochlear implant, you can have over a 90% chance of improved quality of life. And I would say the majority of my patients, not always, the majority of my patients probably can talk on the phone after a cochlear implant within about uh, six months. So maybe 75%, and that's just a rough estimate. Some patients may take a year to talk on the phone. Uh, some patients may take longer, or some may never be able to talk on the phone with a cochlear implant. Unfortunately, ABI results show that in the adult patients who receive ABI for NF2, they almost never are able to talk on the phone. But what they're able to do is hear sound around them. Um, so they tend to do a much better job of lip reading. Some of them will have some strange side effects that typically over time gets better, maybe a little bit of slight dizziness or tingling. Um, but they, as time goes on, should be able to do a better job with hearing the telephone, 
um, if it rings or the doorbell, fire alarm, things like that. It takes a lot longer to program an auditory brainstem implant than a cochlear implant. And one of the challenges we have is we can do a great job in the operating room and put the electrodes in good position, but as opposed to a cochlear implant where the electrode almost never leaves the cochlea itself, with an auditory brainstem implant, the electrode can actually shift position. So that's one of the things I, I have patients really avoid doing heavy lifting or straining for a month post-op. My hope is that that electrode stays in good position and doesn't shift at all. So what patients do best with the ABI and may have open set recognition? It turns out this is interesting is the pediatric patients. And it's, it, that tells us that there's something we still don't understand about the complexity of the brain and the neuroplasticity. I think that's the perfect term. So clearly because kids are just amazing. You know, I have twin daughters who are 10 years old and their ability to learn things is so impressive to me. And so an ABI in a pediatric patient is much more likely to have uh, ability to talk on the phone, but not in an adult patient or definitely not one with NF2. So we need to figure out why that is. And the hope is whether those medications or auditory training, you know, what are the things that we can do to have adult patients perform as well as the kids do? And I think that would really help us uh, do better with uh, outcomes and performance. So what are the approaches to place an ABI? Um, the original approach is the translabyrinthine approach that Bill House and uh, Bill Hitzelberger first discussed. That was used for many, many years. Uh, the problem is trans means across, labyrinth means across the inner ear. So if you have someone with an acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma, doing a translabyrinthine approach is not necessarily bad. But if you have a child, for example, who has cochlear nerve aplasia, maybe an auditory brainstem implant candidate or recipient, uh, he or she may actually have balance function that's still normal. And so because of that reason, we don't want to cut into their inner ear. We decide to go behind the inner ear in what's called a retrosigmoid approach. And then I've been very fortunate. I've got a phenomenal co-surgeon that I work with, Mara Zuccarello, and I'll show you some slides. We're the first group in the world actually use a different approach called the extended middle fossa approach. We actually go above the ear. And so we're doing research in our lab and the hope is that maybe by doing extended middle fossa approach that maybe that will allow us better outcomes uh, potentially. So it's still early and new. Uh, we'll see how uh, this approach pans out. So slide for the different approaches. The middle fossa approach is going above the ear. So this is the right side of the skull that you see here, going above the ear. The translabyrinthine approach is right behind the ear, going through the inner ear. And the sigmoid sinus is right here. It's one of the main veins in the head. It goes down into the jugular vein in the neck. And this retrosigmoid or suboccipital approach is another name for it. That's when you go behind everything, behind the sigmoid sinus, behind the uh, inner ear as well. So these are the three different approaches that are potentially available. So this is a wonderful story of a lady um, who came to me who is just uh, suffering for NF2. So NF2, on the one hand, we talk about bilateral acoustic neuromas, but these patients unfortunately have a lot of other tumors as well. So she saw an outside surgeon and she saw had uh, a resection, partial resection of her acoustic neuroma. This is fat packing from a prior translabyrinthine approach. That's how we close off the, the, the wound after surgery to prevent brain fluid from leaking out. And what's tough for her is not only does she have this acoustic neuroma, she also has a separate tumor here. So it looks like it's one tumor, it's actually not. And these are some lower cranial nerve tumors. And that's one of the challenging things for these patients is they have multiple tumors inside the skull, meningiomas, ependymomas, spinal schwannomas. So it can be a really tough quality of life for some of these patients. So this lady comes in, she's a mom, has two uh, boys, I think, young twin boys, and she comes in with her aunt. Her aunt is an amazing lady. She lives across the hallway from her aunt, and the aunt helps take care of the little boys as well. And this lady comes in. She is not only deaf, but has imbalance because these tumors have affected both sides in terms of balance. She has a, you don't see the other side well, but she has a tumor on the other side as well. And then she's also blind. 
So the only way she communicates is with finger spelling with her aunt. And her aunt literally spells everything out. So we decided to take out the right tumor. And basically what we did is we went from a middle fossa approach, took out that top part of that tumor, and I'll, I'll go back again. This is that tumor, and that's the part that we took out. And you can see the brainstem implant there. And the reason you can see that this is the artifact on the MRI scan from the brainstem implant. And um, this part of the tumor is now gone. The other tumor is left alone. These are her other tumors, by the way. I was talking about the meningiomas. You can see some other tumors here. None of these, fortunately, need surgery at this point in time. And so this is an, an interesting view. So if you look, this is as if she's lying on the table. This is the right side. It's amazing. This All this white is bone. And this is the middle fossa approach that we used on her. And you can see the amount of bone that's missing. This is all skull that's missing. And uh, the reason we chose this approach on her is she only has one functional sigmoid sinus. And so our concern if we did any other approach is if we damage that sigmoid sinus, that puts her at risk of a stroke with this procedure. So we ended up leaving the bone there, going from above. And this is the fat packing that we use at the end of the case. This is on MRI scan. And this is a side view. This is after a brainstem implant is in position. This is the ground electrode. And this is that paddle, the active electrode, and showing where it goes into the brainstem there. And this is the CT scan view again. And you can see this is the electrode going into the brainstem. And we call this the Bearcat approach, just uh, named after our University of Cincinnati mascot, uh, just as a unique different way to uh, approach brainstem implants. And I think what's most amazing about this is not the surgery. You know, you always have to look back and say, why did you do a surgery like this? I think what's amazing, what's been so gratifying for me is this is a lady who went from being deaf and blind to now she can hear sounds. So for example, when her kids come home from school, she can actually hear her sons come into her apartment. And so she has interaction with them for the first time in her life. And so I think uh, that's one of the most amazing things, but I'd like to see her do even better. And um, with continued practice, my hope and prayer for her is that she continues to do well. I'm gonna finish up here, last couple of slides and uh, one of my favorite quotes something that we all need to think about as physicians and as people involved with healthcare. This is from George Merck, who founded the Merck Pharmaceuticals. We try never to forget that medicine is for the people. It is not for the profits. The profits follow. And if you remember that, they've never failed to appear. And I think one of the things is being a father, these are my twin daughters who are 10 years old here, uh, or they're 10 years old now, but they were they're three or four years old at the time. And so you always have to think of yourself. I train residents and fellows. And one of the things I'll ask my residents and fellows is if that was your son or daughter or father or mother or husband or wife, what would you do for that patient? And so I think it, when you do that, it helps you get into a good perspective. So with that, I will finish. Thank you for allowing me to take uh, part of your evening and, and I'll have Nancy ask uh, any questions, um, but thanks for allowing me part of this. Thank you, that's fascinating. Um, we have a very important question to start off, and yes. that comes from Jess Toes. And Jess would like to know if you are wearing crazy socks right now. <laughs> Tell her I'm actually at home, and I've already taken off my shoes and socks for the day. Okay, <laughs> there you go, Jess. <laughs> of course, Jessica will always ask the curveball question. I've never not gotten a curveball from <laughs> From Jessica. <laughs> um, that's pretty funny. Um, I was uh, just looking at the participant list while you were presenting, and I was, uh, I guess, surprised to see that Jess was on the webinar tonight, but I was glad to see her there let's because. Her then. If she's uh, <laughs> here, let's, let's show her. I got to see uh, <laughs> a photo of her. Uh, because we, um, as I, I mentioned to you before, uh, we have a, a longtime HLA member, Barbara Chertok, that is interested uh, in writing an article about Jess for That's our right. magazine, which is called Hearing Life. 
and uh, Barbara's a very, very good writer. And so we've already worked it out. Jess is going to email me and forward that on to Barbara. So, so if you're um, a member of HLAA and you receive the magazine, uh, look for that hopefully sometime soon. <laughs> and I want to publicly thank Jessica. I think what she's done is, and this is one of the reasons HLAA exists, is a lot of times patients don't know what's available to them. And I think this empowers patients to know an auditory brainstem implant's a rare thing. Most people will never need this. But the more we educate patients so they understand that there are things that they can do to, to recover and improve their quality of life. Um, so thanks, Jessica, for what you've done for all the patients that have gotten to know you and for me in particular. Okay, Laura Lee says, I have an ear with nothing in it thanks to three operations and infections. Would a uh, brainstem uh, implant be able to restore an, or be a new mechanism that she could use to hear? Sure, potentially. Um, but so typically when I see someone in my office, I'll say, okay, what were the three surgeries? This could be everything from a mastodectomy for cholesteatoma and chronic otitis media, bad ear infections. It could be deafness due to stapedectomy, uh, a seculoplasty will reconstruct the hearing mechanism. So there's a variety of reasons. So the thing is making sure that uh, we pick what's right. So I've had patients who've had Bajas, bone anchored hearing aids, osteointegrated integrated implants. That may be actually the best solution or a cochlear implant. So I think there are options for hearing restoration. Um, so an ABI in that case, wouldn't probably be my first choice, but never say never. Is that typically your last option then you would look at? Yes. So that's a great way to say it, absolutely. Because okay. it's working around the brainstem. So it's never something to take lightly. If there's something, you know, always go with what's the simpler, easier, safer solution for the patient. Mm -hmm. So an ABI is potentially a great option, but I would try to keep that as my last resort. Okay, fair enough. Is the external processor the same unit that is used for the cochlear implant? Correct. So uh, Jessica can talk about this uh, better than I as, as someone who's a recipient. So it's really neat to see that the newest sound processor, the Nucleus 7, has the ability to uh, interact with your iPhone. And so what's amazing is, and I think now even the Android phones as well, and so what's amazing is you can actually have the sound processor on and do FaceTime and other things directly with your iPhone or, or Android phone. So yes, it is the same. And the programming is different, but otherwise externally it looks the same. Okay, um, you know, that gives me an idea. Maybe Jessica would like to do a webinar sometime um, as well. And um, Jessica, if that's uh, of interest, let me know when you email me. That would be great. Um, that would be really interesting too. Then I can call in and ask if she's wearing crazy socks. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carly asks, um, hi, so would you only use an ABI if the cochlear implant wasn't an option? I think we probably answered that. Um, but also just to clarify, would someone with an ABI ever be able to hear speech or just have sound awareness? So sound awareness would be my first goal. Um, but as I was saying earlier, the younger the patient, definitely pediatric patients, and I'm sorry, it's Carly. Is that right, Nancy? Is mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on Carly's age. So it's very possible that the younger the patient and the cause or the etiology of the hearing loss. So I you know, always want to give patients a sense of hope and optimism and yet be realistic at the same time. So I would say, go with sound awareness first. Go with environmental sounds. Go with what can you do to improve lip reading. But it is possible as time goes on, there may be different things we can do to improve the outcomes to get to the point where the person can communicate with um, a use of a telephone, for example. Okay. Uh, Tom asks, how is the paddle located on the nerve? How do you know where to put it and how that's is it That's a great secure? question. So that's the biggest challenge, Tom. So what we struggle with is you can find the brain stem. You can find the entrance to the brain stem. It's called the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle. So that area is near the lower cranial nerves. There's 12 cranial nerves in the head and neck, 12 major nerves. 
these are the ones that include everything from the ability to smell and uh, see and so on. And so as you go through these different nerves, you can find the opening. You put the paddle inside the opening, but unfortunately when you put the paddle inside the opening, you can't secure it as easily as you can a cochlear implant. And so we put that in and then we do a lot of testing when the patient's on the operating room table. So we check and see how, what, cause the patient's asleep, obviously. We can't ask them, can you hear the sound? So we put the paddle in and then we test and with our equipment say, do we feel like it's in a good position? And if it's not, then we end up shifting the paddle a little bit more. The challenge for us is you can get electrical signals, but those electrical signals, are those the same thing exactly as what the patient's hearing? Uh, that's what we don't know. And so we have to wait until the patient um, is able to then respond and tell us later. And, you know, Jessica would be a perfect example as well. When she does the webinar, I think her talking about both cochlear implants and brainstem implants and what she hears and how she uh, has learned to have such a great uh, outlook on life um, and how she copes with the hearing loss. That'd be great to do, to ask her. Okay, uh, sounds good. Um, Elizabeth says, I'm an early intervention teacher and I'm curious if you can give any information about the status of ABI implantation for children here in the US. Yes. How many have been implanted and what is the minimum age? So there are probably now four centers in the country that are starting to look at uh, ABIs. We'll probably be the fifth center looking at pediatric population. So there's probably only about, I would say 10 to 20 patients in the country total that have been implanted. So a very small number in a country of 330 million. And so I think that as much as Dr. Coletti's done a remarkable job in Italy, and there's some centers throughout Europe and around the world, um, people are realizing that because the ABI is something they're doing on a child as young as one year of age or two years of age, you want to make sure that you have the electrode in good position on a pediatric brainstem, which is incredibly small. And so some of the patients that we used to think about going straight to ABI for, we're realizing that some of them, even though it looks like they're not having a cochlear nerve, that maybe the first step should be to try a cochlear implant first to see if there's any sound, because that's much easier. You can do cochlear implant surgery. It can be outpatient or just overnight stay one night, whereas an ABI is at risk, you know, 1% risk of a major complication, but that's 1% risk of stroke, 1% risk of meningitis, brain fluid leak. So it is growing in the U.S., but I think we're probably a little more conservative about it right now um, besides uh, Italy, um, Germany, and the UK are probably the two other areas that have done uh, a decent number of ABIs. So I think it's a mixed bag, unfortunately. Some of the kids have done remarkably well, but some have had some serious complications and concerns and issues. And so that's why I think in the US, the FDA is looking at this very closely because we don't want to hurt anyone while we're doing this. Right. Um, how can an audiologist approach the ABI versus cochlear implant conversation? What should they know for counseling purposes? Um, I think it's just good to bring both together. So counseling, as you know, is probably the most important part of success. And I would say that's not only for the success of an ABI or CI. Over the years with my audiology colleagues in our department, what I've noticed is our patients can do really well or do really poorly with hearing aids. And I've learned a lot from them that they feel like the counseling, the realistic expectations are so important for hearing aids. And so what I would say to the parents or to the patients themselves is, listen, you know, um, are your child's not doing well with hearing aids? And we think that maybe it's time to refer the patient for cochlear implant evaluation. However, you know, I know from the history, for example, let's say, you know, the child was born with certain congenital abnormalities or the patient had some severe uh, fractures from uh, a car accident, that it's not unreasonable to talk about the ABI because I think the more we all talk about it, it allows patients to be more educated, just to know more about it. And I think the resources on the internet are amazing. I know there's some not so good websites, but if you go to some really 
reputable websites and, and our young patients and millennials are so bright. They go onto the internet and they search and get some basic information. And I like that. So, you know, I think it's great. Whenever you mention a cochlear implant to a patient, just say, you know, most likely your child or you yourself won't be a cochlear implant candidate. I mean, won't be an auditory brain stem implant candidate, but that is also a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, Tony from Michigan uh, says, I've read that we know which parts of the brain are receptive to each frequency. So is this a technique used to determine if the ABI implant is successful? So not yet. So our goal is we're just hopeful that those 22, and I'm going to go back to that picture for a moment, which I think is nice to have that in front of us. So when we put this into the fourth ventricle, the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle, we're hopeful that these electrodes contact the nucleus and contact them really well. The challenge for us is to know which ones are going to correspond to which frequencies. And so let's even go to the next step because some of the patients have not done as well as we'd like with auditory brain stem implant. Maybe this is getting to what Tony's question is. There are now people that are actually putting the cochlear uh, or auditory brain stem implant. Let me go to that slide here. There we go. So they're saying, well, wait a second, maybe it's not working here. What if we put this higher up in the brain stem? Oh. That's called an auditory midbrain implant. Uh, there's a uh, doctor from Hanover, Germany, Professor Thomas Lennartz, and I think he's implanted two or three patients now to see. And so the data is so new, but I think that's a great question to ask is that maybe some of the problems we're having, especially with the adults not hearing as well as we'd like, maybe by going higher up here that we'll get better outcomes. Hmm. And so, you know, it's interesting. I always look back at like Bill House's legacy and he talked about how he was really skewered by fellow physicians as well as the public at large saying that cochlear implants were crazy, they would never work, what a stupid idea. And so I think things like auditory brainstem implant and, and auditory midbrain implant, you know, I think it's great to think about these as ways that we could improve quality of life for patients in whom the cochlear implant won't work. Okay. Um... Dr. Sami, you mentioned that patients can hear sounds after ABI. What are the differences in what an ABI recipient hears versus someone with typical hearing? I'm assuming um, you might be she might be referring to sounds like sirens or things like that. Sure. Yeah. To... Um, so I would say that the best thing to think about, and in fact, depending on the patient, you know, I've now done cochlear implants for 20 years, for two decades. And I have to tell you, early on in my career, just being fresh out of fellowship and training, I don't think I did a good enough job in getting patients to understand that a cochlear implant is not your normal God-given hearing. You're going to realize that it's artificial, it's electronic. And so I think we're getting, for example, incredibly good with cochlear implants with speech. But one of the challenges, for example, is... Uh, complex musical uh, sections. Take Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, for example. You know, trying to have a cochlear implant and software algorithm try to do a good job with that is very hard. So what I do a better job with now with my patients, and it comes with experience of doing this for a while, is saying to them, listen, what would you like to do with your cochlear implant? What's your goal? And for some of my patients, they're just happy that maybe they can hear their grandchild for the first time or, or hear some sounds. Uh, I have other patients who are musicians and say, hey, I'm losing my hearing. I want you to put a cochlear implant in me, and I want to hear great again, and so I can hear music just as well as before. And I'll tell them, I said, you know, I'll say to them that they have a much more discriminating ear. If you're a musician, you hear and you think about sounds much at a much different level than the average person. And so I think – you got to go with what the expectations are and letting patients know that when you first turn on a cochlear implant or auditory brainstem implant, patients will say it's a very weird and odd sound, electrical, uh, artificial sounding. But I think this goes back to the brain, the ability over time for the brain to convert what sounds very unusual at first, whether it's a siren, for example, to a sound that you say, oh, and now I know what that is. 
cochlear implant patients over the years, I've had patients who thought their cochlear implant was man- malfunctioning because one of my patients said that whenever he walked into the kitchen here, he heard a hum and he thought his cochlear implant was malfunctioning. And his wife said, no, that's the sound of the refrigerator, right? He had no idea that the, the fridge makes a sound. I've had other patients say they had no idea that the turn signal in a car makes a sound. So they couldn't figure out why they heard a clicking sound whenever they turned on the turn signal. Um, if you think of learning with a cochlear implant or a brainstem implant, like learning a foreign language, you know, I've never spoken Japanese in my life, but if you had me sitting in Tokyo and I lived there for six months or a year, what would sound initially very odd and unusual for me would over time turn to something that I can actually over, not over a week or two, but over several months, six months, a year, I would actually understand that sound not being so strange anymore, but something that actually resembles a language. And that's a good way to think about how cochlear implants or brainstem implants work, which is much different than just putting on hearing aids, which is uh, an easier uh, thing for most patients. When people have an ABI or um, cochlear implant, does that sound that sounds electrical at the beginning eventually sound different, more natural sound? Yes. I don't think it ever sounds 100% natural. You know, who's a, it's a good category to think about is we used to do cochlear implants in patients who are deaf in both ears. And now we're starting to do for the last five to seven years in the U.S., I've been doing probably about five now, uh, single-sided deafness cochlear implantation. So I have patients who have normal hearing on one side and they're deaf on the other side. And I think initially we had a huge interest in doing this because these are patients who are completely deaf a hearing aid won't work. Um, yes, you could try a Baja, maybe a cross hearing aid, by cross hearing aid. But the reality is you still only have one cochlear that works. So early on, I was using this quite a bit on a lot of single-sided deafness cochlear implant or single-sided deafness patients. But I realized once again, you have to take a step back and make sure it's the right thing for the right patient. So mm-hmm. some of my patients were really challenged by hearing normally one ear, hearing a cochlear implant on the other side, and trying to get their brain to combine both sounds put together. And so I think some of the patients early on were not that happy with it. Uh, But what's really neat is over time, if they persisted and over a year or two, they noticed not only did they hear sound much better, one of my patients and Jessica knows this lady, she's also a very dynamic lady. She is a business lady who travels a lot, very active. And so she wears a hearing aid on one side, cochlear implant on the other side. She hated the cochlear implant at first, yet at the same time, she wouldn't take it off. And so she put up with it for a while. And then what's neat is at one point in time, she said that she started realizing that she couldn't leave home without her cochlear implant. And she realized as long as she practiced with it, that it wasn't normal hearing, but allowed her to feel like she had a sense of hearing on the deaf side. So it tells you that you can get your brain to learn how to deal with sound. And I think what's neat with things like cochlear implants, and especially for patients who have single-sided deafness, and if they have bad tinnitus, you know, tinnitus is a big problem, as we all know. So some of my patients don't even care about their hearing loss. They're more bothered by the tinnitus. And so what's really neat is cochlear implants have been shown, as have hearing aids, that most patients, if they are good candidates for based on their audiogram, um, can really get an improvement in their tinnitus with hearing aids or cochlear implants. And I've not seen any significant problems, knock on wood, with auditory brainstem implants. I don't think I've had any patient complain of problems with tinnitus post-op. And I think for them, they're just happy to hear again. Speaking of hum, if you hear a hum, it's the vacuum cleaner in our suite here. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to hear my cat. My cat was making a sound. So, <laughs> Um, if there is failure of an ABI or CI, what, what are typically the causes for such failure? So I would say for an ABI, the concern would be how good did it work in the operating room? So we don't have good electrical response. And that's happened to me where I had a patient with a, an acoustic neuroma. She had not heard for many years. And the longer you have sound deprivation or sensory deprivation, the less likely I think we are to do as well with an ABI. And so I didn't get good uh, electrical uh, response. And then post-op, she didn't hear anything either. 
So usually we should know. Now that being said, that other the other things happen where I've had good electrical response, and then I am concerned that that paddle that we talked about that's supposed to sit in the the uh, on, on the nucleus that it shifts. It can shift post op, and if it shifts post op then you worry that that may be the reason that there's failure. Uh, other things, so here's the cochlear implant. You can have electrode shift, but this is also a man-made device. You also have to think about, is there a problem with the actual device itself? Does somehow the device have a breakdown in it? And luckily that's very rare nowadays. Most patients that get implanted should be able to wear the device for decades but you have to look at all these different aspects. And then some of it is, I think also I ask patients themselves, you know, some of the patients you have to make sure they're truly, truly invested and motivated. I think having a good support system, having good family and friends to help them uh, hear better and, and want to hear better is incredibly important. So I also make sure that the failure is really not just the device is the failure higher up in the brain. In other words, are they spending the time needed you know, they're calling a failure when they really need to just give more time to get used to it. Right. Um, with the advances in technology, um, do you see that there will be advances in ABI implants? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you always want to think about if I was going through this or my daughters, or my wife, right, what would you do? And it's, it's interesting. You've got to do it for the patients. It's really hard to see some patients coming. I've been, a young lady came in to see me and she's been deaf for decades. And, um, and my worry, she came in to see me for an ABI. We're getting an MRI scan. And, and my concern is her brain's not heard for so long that I'm not positive that an ABI will even do it. And she can't get a cochlear implant because she doesn't have cochlear nerves. And so you always want to figure out what you can do to help that individual sitting in front of you to improve the quality of life because she's young. She's 19 or 20 years old and, and she's got 60, 70, 80 years ahead of her. Mm -hmm. Help her uh, do as best as she can. Right. Um, you, you mentioned that Medel is not available in the United States. Are they working to gain FDA approval here? Yeah, actually it's, I'm actually one of the people that's pushing for them to uh, try to gain uh, FDA approval. And so I think it's just such a small number in relation to cochlear implants. But yeah, I think it'd be nice to know what's different about their device. What can we do to evaluate it? Are there things that will allow us to have an electrode? Is it their paddle that's different? Would that allow it to secure, us, secure it easier? So the answer is yes, I hope that uh, that's something that we'll look at in the next uh, few years at the latest. Okay, and when you have the ABI implant, I say they're, they're is a newer, better, does it necessarily mean you have to have surgery again? No, not at all. You know, it's um, for cochlear implants, that is gonna be something that's more common. So for example, let's say you implant a one year old now, we know that he or she, um, if they have another 80, 90 years ahead of them, we all know technology is gonna change. Or while these devices are meant to last for decades, does that mean they're gonna last for 80 or 90 years? I would think not. So my assumption is for a pediatric patient, it wouldn't be surprising to have to replace a cochlear implant. But for an auditory brainstem implant, that is a much bigger deal because what you worry about is you have something sitting in the brainstem. And as far as I'm aware, there's not a single patient in the world who's ever had an old ABI taken out and a fresh one put in. I could be wrong, but as far as I'm aware, I don't think that's occurred. And if you do consider it, you just have more risks of potential damage to the brain and and so, uh, you know, something is a last resort. And the other thing is, you know, doing two sides, doing both brain stems, not at the same time. Mm -hmm. and if one side fails, then you have another side potentially that is usable. Uh, is the auditory rehab for an ABI recipient the same as the CI rehab or? Um, so some of it is, um, but it's much more intense. And I think once again, that's a great question um, for Jess for whenever she does her webinar. It is a much more prolonged process. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think patients have to be patient with it. It is something that is not gonna be as easy to do. So part of it's the same, but part of it's also more labor and time intense. 
Okay. Um, we are uh, working with KDH Research in Atlanta on a website for older adults that have uh, a CI, and it's very much focused on not just that person, but also their friends and family. So um, that's something that we continue to work on, and hopefully it'll be a really great resource for people um, when it's finished. That is incredibly important. I don't have a date for that, though. But uh, Kudos to you. I think that it is a journey one has to take with a family member. I would look back at my history. I've probably done, I'm going to say, roughly anywhere from 400 to 500 cochlear implants now. And the patients I remember that did not do well, some of the patients, it's because they just they came in alone. They had no family with them, no support system. So I'm very blessed in our city. Uh, Cincinnati, it turns out, has one of the three biggest uh, cochlear implant support groups. And oh, it's been very, you know, it's a very, Cincinnati has always been a very family-friendly uh, kind of city. And there's nothing like patients help patients. Because someone like Jessica is going to speak more volume and be more trusted by patients than I am. And the only reason I say that is because I may have done this for two decades, but I've never worn a cochlear implant. I've never worn a brainstem implant. And so I actually now, my rule of thumb is I will not implant a patient with a cochlear implant or an ABI until they first go to the support group. Because to me, if they're willing to put the time and effort, the support group meets on Saturdays mm -hmm. once a month. If they're willing to go to the support group, that means they truly have a vested interest. And then they've also in the support group, you know, kudos to the people that are there. They actually have a buddy program. Mm -hmm. So now you can partner with someone. And so if you see someone who's your same gender, about your same age, I think, you know, an 80 year old is going to be much more comfortable with another 75 year old person than he or she would be with a 20 year old. And so mm -hmm. we're trying to, those are the kinds of things I think help patients. So I think the online resources are great support groups, the more connection you make with others, I think the better your journey will be. Mm -hmm. We have uh, many of the people on the webinar tonight know um, our volunteer in our office that didn't hear for very, uh, like a very long time. And um, she says we kind of pushed her, but we, we <laughs> really did. It, 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 took, um, it took a while for her to realize that she was really missing out on a lot. And uh, got a cochlear implant, and now she hears everything. I mean, she hears much more than we ever thought she would. We were just hoping for environmental sounds, you know? That's funny. Um, but she hears everything, and sometimes, you know, she she's like, that drives me crazy. Yesterday, her her shoes were squeaking, and it was driving her crazy. That's funny. And, um, you know, <laughs> like, you just need, to, your brain needs some time to, like, yes. You know, absolutely. I mean, I think, and, and for some of my patients, it's amazing. You, you have the whole gamut of patients. I've got my 20 year olds that have already been on the internet. They've Googled reams of information. They come in with, have you seen this study, that study? Then I've got other patients who hate computers. They, they won't go on a computer. And mm -hmm. so they come in with very limited knowledge. And so you have to really coach them. And I think what you said about your, um, your coworker is important. So she did very well, but cochlear implants and especially brainstem implants, one of the reasons I have to make the patient choose is because if God forbid there's a major complication, which is incredibly rare, but if there is, I would feel horrible if they felt like I forced them into that. Right. Just, you know, I want them to feel like it's truly something they want and desire because then once there's more buy-in on their part, I think they're going to be more motivated and, and want to do the work that's needed. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. She gets her rehab training every single day. <laughs> um, well, I think we have pretty much covered um, all of the, the questions and I want to thank you again very much for this presentation. It was fascinating and, uh, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Absolutely, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Thank have you. a good night. All right, you too, good night. Good night.